Uh, he, he called and said he thinks he's got coronavirus. No way. He said he's sick. He just he just can't get over it. No. So I don't know. And then Miss Catherine got sick a while ago and she left. But you know what? We're not going to let old devil beat us today. We're still going to have services. We're still going to sing. Y'all get to listen to old Ronnie preach. I'm going to do the best I can. God's, God's got it all prepared. He's got it all prepared. We got us a new piano player over here. She picked out some basic songs. But we're going to, hey, yeah, we're going to do chopsticks. Y'all know how to sing chopsticks? <laughs> twinkle, twinkle, little star. Jesus loves me. Hey, that's one of the best songs in the world. You learn when you're a little kid, you know it all your life. I remember I remember looking at it that Jesus loves me. I didn't know there were second and third verses to it. Yeah. But there are. I just knew that one, the first one. Yeah. But if you keep on, there's more verses. Look here, we got sick people coming in left and right. Mr. It, Reese's back, she's been sick for two weeks. Oh Lord, man, I tell you. I'm not going to be on camera today, am I? Man, don't make me put pressure here. No pressure. I am? All right. What? <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. It just gets worse and worse, doesn't it? All right, we got a few more minutes. We know some stragglers will be coming in. Is everybody doing all right today? Did y'all come to the house of the Lord to praise Him today? Yes. Man, I'm going to tell you what. Let me just give you a little breakdown of what's going on. Brother Scotty called this morning. He said he was sick. He thinks he's going to go get tested for coronavirus again. He don't know if he's... You know, he was sick a couple of weeks ago, and he, just, he's, he said, I can't throw this. He said, I'll be in at 11 o'clock. But I think Brother Jerry called and said, don't come in, because if you got coronavirus, we don't need you coming up here and preaching to everybody and getting spreading it. We don't know what he's got, but let's pray for him today. And then our, uh, who's that? Oh, that's Brother Scotty? Yeah. All right. He's in the hospital somewhere. He's in the hospital? Coming somewhere. Oh, man, we need to pray for old Brother Scotty if he's in the hospital. And then Miss Catherine, after they got through rehearsing the music for today, she got sick. And I said, you know what? The old devil's trying his best to disrupt our service today, but, you know, we're not going to let him. I was telling this morning in Sunday school, this morning when I got up, I get up every morning and go walking. And as I was walking, something in me was saying, be ready. And it always happens like that. When, you know, when Brother Scotty usually calls me, I've got an hour or two to get ready to preach. But I always have fair warning because something is telling me, hey, be prepared today. That's the Spirit of God. You know, I think to myself, if I, am I going to be nervous? Am I going to mess up? But I think, no, because God put me in this position, he's going to provide for me. Amen? Amen. So I'm not going to worry about that. We're going to have a good time. So listen, if y'all will turn to your hymnals, to page 236 in the Baptist hymnal. We're going to sing our song that we always do on, on the Sunday morning when Miss Catherine's not here. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. And we're going to get this day started right. Amen. Brother Jerry, you want to start us out in a word of prayer before we get going? Holy God, we come to you this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts that we're here in your house. And we want, to, we want you to help us, each one of us, Lord, to just praise you in a way that will be worthy unto you and that will please you, Father. Be with each one of us. Be with the music. Be with the word, Lord, this morning. Ask your anointing and your blessing upon each and every one. In Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Y'all stand up. Let's stand up and enjoy. Get that blood circulating. Bless that wonderful name there, Brenda. Uh, Belinda. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you don't play that one? Oh, where's our guitar player? He's not coming out? Oh, uh, well, yeah, we're going to sing it a cappella. Y'all know how to do that, don't you? All right, ready? Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. 
No other name I know Sing that wonderful name of Jesus We're going to sing that wonderful name of Jesus Sing that wonderful name of Jesus No other name I know Y'all shake hands if you want to. That's the only, you know, we don't want to spread no viruses, but say hi to everybody. Just uh, look at each other, smile, wave. Listen, if you got, if you want to say, I, I don't know what I got thankful to be for today, but you know what? If you're alive and breathing, Amen. you got plenty to be thankful for. Because you know what? We could be off worse. We, you know, uh, we just need to just keep on blessing God and thanking Him for what He does for us. Amen. And for sure, let's pray for our brother Scotty, okay? Let's just give a special prayer for him right now. Father, I thank you for my pastor, Brother Scotty. And Father, we know that he loves you and he wishes he could be here. But Satan is hindered in everything he can to try to keep our joy and our happiness from, from taking place today. But Father, you promised us that if we loved you, that if we obeyed you, that we, that we sought after you, Father, you would, you would draw nigh to us and we'd have that joy. So, Father, just take care of Brother Scotty today. Help him to feel better. Help him to get well, Father, whatever he's going through. You're the great physician. Be with us also, Lord, as we worship and praise you today. God, we just want to honor you because you're worthy. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing verse uh, 4 and 5 there. Praise that wonderful name of Jesus. We're going to praise that wonderful name of Jesus. Praise that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name I know. Share that wonderful name of Jesus. We're going to share that wonderful name of Jesus. Share that wonderful name of Jesus no other name I know amen all right Melinda let's so, uh, page 132 in this uh, in our was it in, the, in this back or the little all right page uh, 132 there's power in the blood we got a piano player on this one so it drowned out my squeaky voice here <laughs> Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or will the victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder.
wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Now we're going to look at page 139. At the cross, I was reading it uh, this week. Spurgeon was talking, and, you know, when you have troubles in life, he said, look to the cross. That's where it's all taken care of. Amen. So at the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinner such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Thus might I hide my blushing face while Calvary's cross appears. Is of my heart in thankfulness and melt mine eyes to tears. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. We got one more there. It's page 182. What a friend we have in Jesus. That's the truth, isn't it? What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. 
Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. Take and shield thee, thou wilt fill the soul is there. Amen. Thank you for playing the piano for us. Hey, that's what it's all about, serving God. You step up when you need it. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you, Eric. I don't know where Connor was. I don't know. He didn't show up. But anyway, y'all can, can be seated. You know, John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. And uh, that's one of the greatest songs ever written. But he also wrote one in 1779 that I was reading. I was, uh, I was reading a book by John MacArthur, and he quoted the words from the song. So I'm, I'm the kind, when I'm reading, I want to see where that come from. Where did that come from? And if you, you Google anything, you just put in the words, and it'll pop up the song. But this song is called, I Saw One Hanging on a Tree. And it goes like this, and I want, to think, I want you to think about it. If you, don't know, if you don't know Jesus today as your Savior, listen to these words. He said, I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never to my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins, his blood had spilt, and helped to nail him there. A second look he gave which said, I freely will forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that, may, that thou may live. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. Man, I tell you what, that's wonderful love right there. We talked about this morning about the love of God. Nobody can fathom the love of God. But Jesus hung on a tree for you and for me. Did he have to? No. But you know why he did it? So that we would have everlasting life and be with him forever in heaven. So today I want to talk a little bit about what kind of house do you live in? You know, I, I, people in America spend all their life working to, to have a place to live. Amen? I mean, the house I live in... I'll, I'll be dead before it's paid pay for, you know? But I go and work every day for it because I have to have somewhere to live. Amen? We all have to work for a, li you know, for a living to some somewhere to live. You know, there's an old saying that every man's home is his castle. And we all strive in life to have a home, a safe place to be. You know, when you're locked in your house, you feel safe. Nobody can bother you. But you know, that's just a physical home here on earth. Jesus said one day all this going to burn up. It ain't going to amount to anything. You know, the Bible says it's an appointed and a man wants to die. And after that's judgment. One of these days, but if Jesus doesn't come back, I'm going to die. And that house is not going to mean anything to me. I can't take it with me. 
But you know what I have to do? During the meantime, I have to prepare a home for my soul. A home for our soul. A spiritual home. You know, John MacArthur said there's two kinds of people in the earth today. There's only two. Now you say, oh man, that's crazy because there's thousands of different kind of people. Different kind of cultures and different kind of backgrounds and eth eth ethnicity and all that stuff. But there's only two kinds of people on earth today. You're either saved or you're unsaved. You know, Jesus said that you are either for me or you're against me. There are those who love God and those who don't. Those who believe and those who don't believe. Those who are assured of life eternal and those who are condemned forever. John 3.18 says that he that believeth is not condemned. Those who dwell and abide in God and those who don't. That's why I ask today, what kind of home do you have for your soul? Because one of these days, when you die, your spirit's going to leave and it's going to go to one or two places. You make that choice today where it's going. Amen? You're just going to either go to hell or it's going to go to heaven. There's no other choices about it. So the question today is where are you dwelling at? Where do you live? Where's your house built and how's it been built? Where is your soul's house? That's what we have to think about today. You know, another word for a house or a home is a dwelling. Amen? And the Hebrew word for dwell is yashab, Y-A-W-S-H-A-B. And it means to dwell, to remain, to sit down, to stay, to have one's abode to live in. These are descriptions of a home. And it's not just an earthly home, but a spiritual home. So ask yourself, where am I dwelling today? Where am I abiding at today? Where do I sit at? Where do I stay? 1 John 4.13 says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. In other words, the words, we abide in him. That's our home. That's where you want to build your eternal home, is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Now let me ask you, do you want a house for your souls? We all would love to have a house like that, wouldn't we? But what does it cost? How much would you have to pay for a house like that? I can tell you that because of our proud human nature, we would try to pay whatever we could to get that house, wouldn't we? It's called self-righteousness. Hey, I'll do whatever it takes to get that house. But guess what? This house can't be brought with money. There's no price set up on this house for your soul. Let me open with prayer before we get started. Father, I thank you so much that you've given me the opportunity to speak today. And Father, all I can do is just lift myself up to you and say, Lord, you use me. Let these words that I wrote three or four months down ago be used today to glorify you. And Father, if there be anybody in here that doesn't know where their soul is right now, if they don't know if it's in an earthly home or if it's in a heavenly home, to God, just let it be revealed to them that they need you. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Thank you for the opportunity just to get up here and sing and do the best we can to praise you. We ask that you just move now, that you speak to our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Psalms 127.1 says this, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You know, I think about 
I spent 60 years of my life building a house for my soul in vain. You know, I grew up in church. I remember the only time I, uh, you know, my mom and dad used to make us go when we was little kids. They wouldn't go, but they'd make us go. I'd get so mad. And they say, well, if you don't go to church, you ain't going to be able to play outside this afternoon. So we went, you know, because you wanted to play outside. And my grandparents, when I went to visit my grandparents, I always remember going to, to vacation Bible school and going to the church with my grandmas on Sundays. I thought I was saved at one time when I was younger. But nothing changed in my life. All through my life, I fell away over and over from God. I'd, I'd, I'd get on fire for God, and then I'd go away. And each time I went away, I stayed way farther and longer. I went about my own business. The last time I fell away was when I moved up to Wyoming when I was working up there in oil field. I moved up there, and I, and I went for 10 years without going to church. But when I got back here, I started back. But you know what I was doing? I was trying to earn my way into heaven. I was being self-righteous. I was doing all the good works that I could. Even when I started to seek after God. You know, I was living down in San Antonio and I was working in an oil field down there and that was one of the worst times of my life. I was going through the worst addiction that a person could ever face. But I'll never forget the day I was driving down around the loop there in San Antonio and something just told me that, look, you either choose me or you're going to die. And I chose him. But I wasn't saved at the time. I think all those years I spent at church with my grandparents, God was still working on me. So I got back in church again, right over here in Overton. And listen, the, the first month I was there, the preacher, just because I had taught Sunday school one time, I, I was mentioning the preacher, he said, well, you want to start teaching the adult Sunday school class here? I thought, well, yeah, you know, that might make some points with God. So I started teaching Sunday school. I worked every year at VVS. Listen, I tithed. I was at church every time the door opened. And there was a time I rededicated my life to God. I went down front. But I didn't need to rededicate my life. I needed to be saved. I didn't know that. I was still building my house in vain. You know what I was trying to do? I was trying to pay rent on the house of my soul. And anyone here today that is trying to get into heaven any other way than through Jesus, they're paying rent as well. And that's not going to work. You know, Jesus said, I'm the door. Any man that tries to get in any other way is a thief and a robber. I was a thief and a robber. Everything I did for God was in vain. It didn't have no meaning. Even though I helped little children come to God in VBS, those works didn't count for nothing, except they were saved. But it didn't account for me. I was still lost. Self-righteousness, works-based Religion. That's what I was going through. But then I got saved. People tend to think to, them, to, think to themselves, I would like to pay a respectable rent. I must owe something for my soul's home. It's just too good to be free. I would love to do something to win Christ. There's got to be something that I can do to get this house. But you can't. You can't. Well, here's the bad news. You cannot have this house for it is without a price. 
It's free. And it's offered by God. Now here's the problem with self-righteous people paying rent. And I thought to myself, this was like me. I thought I was good. I got saved when I saw how wicked I was. I believed that the kingdom of God was for those who are worthy of it. I got saved when I realized how unworthy I was. I believed that eternal life could, could be earned. I got saved when I accepted eternal life as a gift. I was busy seeking God's commendation. I got saved when I sought His forgiveness. Amen? God's house is without a price. The question you need to ask yourself today is this. Will I take the master's house on a lease for all of eternity with nothing to pay for it? Nothing but the rent of loving and serving him. That's all it costs you right there. All you got to do is love him and serve him. Will I take Jesus and dwell in him? Let me tell you a little bit about this house for your soul. It's a house not built by human achievement. There's nothing worldly about this house. Let me tell you about this builder. Let me tell you about the furnishings in the house. And I want to tell you the last of all, how to acquire or to build this house yourself. Amen? The builder is Jesus Christ. John 14, 1 through 3 says, and I love these words, the wonderful words of Jesus. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And listen to this. He said in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. The house is built. Jesus built it. That's the greatest thing about God's Word. That's where faith comes from. When you read things like that, God prepared me a house for my soul. Sure, I work on this earth to, to live in my little earthly house, but it's going to be burned up by high hay and stubble. But God's built me a house, and that's where I'm going. Thank God, amen? And if, he, if he, he said, if I go and prepare a place, I'm coming back to get you. We, if you watch the news, everybody talks about, hey, Jesus is coming back soon. I know he is. Are you ready? It's when you least expect it. That's what he said. When, he, when you least expect it, everybody's going to be going along like everything's perfect. But all of a sudden, the Son of Man's going to come like a thief in the night. And us church is going to be gone. I pray for anybody who's left behind. Man, I got, I got family members. I, you know, we've been studying on uh, Wednesday night's revelation and the things that they're going to go through. Man, I don't want that on any of my family. But they won't listen. Whew, it's going to be a bad time. But thank God I have a house built. Amen. The builder is Jesus Christ. Amen. He built it with his own sweat and blood. Amen. He sweat his blood for your house. I love the story when it talks about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember when he went in there to pray? He took those disciples with him. He said, here, y'all stay right here. And he said he went about a, throw, a, a stone's throw away. And he went over there and he, and he leaned down on that rock. And he began to pray. And Luke twenty two forty four says, 
and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down into the ground. Hey, I've never prayed that hard. I think, well, I, I do pretty good at praying, but you know what? God was, uh, Jesus was agonizing. He sweat drops of blood. Spurgeon said, Christ was not afraid to die. What was it then that made that cup so terrible? After dwelling in the love of God for all eternity, he was in a few hours to bear the punishment of man's sin. All of our sins. Jesus was to be made sin for us. He was to come under the curse for us. He was to feel the Father's wrath on account of human guilt. And his whole nature, not only his flesh, but his whole being, shrank from that fearful ordeal. He knew what he was fixing to face. He was sweating drops of blood. Mm. He spilt his blood for your house. He sweat, he sweat for your house. His blood was spilt for your house. He gave his last blood for our house. John 19, 34, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, they wanted to make sure he was dead. Instead of breaking their legs, they went up to Jesus. They stabbed that spear in his side. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. His blood was spilt for you and me. Every ounce of it. Until the water came out. Whew. This house that Jesus built is furnished with all you want and all you need. It is filled with riches more than you can spend as long as you live. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Listen to some of the furnishings that you're going to find in your house. Galatians 5, 22, 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All the fruits of the Spirit are in that house. I want all those fruits. Especially in the world we live in. Man, I want that love and joy and that peace. Amen? In this house, you can have intimate communion with Christ and feast on His love. The tables are well stocked with food for you to live on forever. John 6, 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. John 6, 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Christ supplies your every need in this house. In this house, when the world and its temptations have you weary, you can find rest. Are you tired and run down by the life of sin? I promise you, sin takes its soul on you, takes its toll on you, and it'll wear you out. But there's a house for your soul built by God in which you can find rest. This is the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Man, I remember that time when I was going through that addiction. Verses like that would come back to me because I would think, man, I'm so tired of what I'm going through. And that verse right there would say, Hey, come unto me, I'll give you rest. But my grandma and them planted those verses there years before. God was still speaking to me. He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. 
For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burdens light. You know, serving sin is way rougher on you than what God does for you. Serving Jesus, it's rough sometimes, but you know what? The, the rewards, they can't be beat. Come is the main word. He drives nobody away. He calls us to himself. His favorite word is come. Spurgeon said we shall not only rest from the guilt of sin, that he's, this, he, this he gives us, but we shall rest in the place of holiness which we, find, which we find through obedience to him. If you want rest, go to Jesus. If you're tired of life and your times are hard for you, go to Jesus and he'll give you rest. Will you have this house? If you're a homeless, uh, a homeless sinner, you may say to yourself, I would love to have a house like this. But may I have it? Are my sins so bad that I could never have this house? No. You, could, you can have such a house. There may be some sins of which a man cannot speak, but there's none there's no sin which the blood of Christ cannot wash away. There are bad things we do in life, but God can forgive them all. You can have this house for your soul, and the key is to come to Jesus. That's the only way to acquire this house. Jesus said in John 14, 6, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You may think you can get that house some other way, but there's not. Maybe you think I'm too shabby for such a house. I lived a terrible, godless life. I'm not worthy of this house. I tell you, never mind that. You must come as you are. Ungodly, lost, you need to come as a complete sinner. There are garments inside for God to clothe you with. Amen. Isaiah 61.10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. You know why? For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. You remember Brother Scott, he did a little, uh, a little example of that when he had Connor come up and he put his coat on him. That's how, that's how God sees us. When we stand before God's throne, we have Jesus' righteousness on our shoulders. Amen. That's all that God sees. I love the story he told about, uh, I've, I remember I in his office watching that preacher was talking about when we stand before God and they start looking in that book uh, of sin and, and, and they can't find your name in there because it's not there anymore. It's been taken out. Because Jesus saved you. Nothing you did in the past will ever be remembered again. I think that was the hardest thing for me after I got saved to think, God's going to remember what I did. Even now, Satan will throw things in my face and say, hey, you remember when you did this and you did that? Because he can't stand for you to be saved. He wants to remind you every day of how bad you are. That's Satan's a liar. Jesus said, you believe in me, you trust me, and you have everlasting life. You don't have to worry about nothing. Your sins are gone. Your past is gone. But I guarantee you, Satan's going to attack you every day trying to make you think you're just a very good person. If you feel guilty and condemned, come. And though the house is too good for you, Christ will make you good enough for the house. Soon enough. How does he do it? God justifies the ungodly person. You see, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Forgiveness is for the guilty. You may think that you're, you need to first change yourself. You need to change your ways before seeking after the house of your soul, but that's not how it works. 
That's not how it happens. You can never be good enough. You got to come to God as you are. A lot of people say, when I, when I get ready, I'll go. Or when I start living a better life, I'll start seeking God. That's not how God wants you. You know, we was reading that Olive Grace book by Charles Spurgeon. And there was a story in there about coming as you are to God. And said a great artist long ago had painted a picture of a part of the city in which he lived. And he wanted for historic purposes to include in his picture certain characters well known in town. A street sweeper who was unkempt and ragged and filthy. You know, you've ever watched uh, Mary Poppins? Remember old Dick Van Dyke, how dirty and nasty he was? And I thought about that. He was a street sweeper, you know, and he was dirty. And he was known to everybody, and there was a suitable place for him in that picture. The artist said to the ragged and rugged man, I will pay you well if you will come down to my studio and let me paint you. He came around in the morning, but was soon sent away. For he had washed his face, combed his hair, and put on clean, respectable clothes. He was needed as a beggar and was not invited any other way. Even so, the gospel will receive no one, will receive you into its halls if you come as a sinner, no other way. You got to come to God as a sinner. That's the only way. Don't attempt to clean yourself up. You know why? Because He will wash you and cleanse you. And you will be able to sing, We dwell in Him. The whole song says this. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Or are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Or are they white as snow? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Or are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's all that matters. The day you stand before God, are you washed in blood? When you dwell in Jesus, your happiness will be multiplied in having such a dwelling place. What a privilege for you to live in such a secure dwelling. Amen? A place of safety. Psalms 4.8 says, and, and this is God speaking, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Proverbs 3.23, Then shalt thou walk in, the way, in thy way safely, and thy, and thy foot shall not stumble. Isaiah 32.18 says, And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. When you dwell in God, you have not only a perfect and secure house, but you have an everlasting one. John 6.47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. This world's going to melt away one day. Talks about it in, in, in Peter. It's going to be melted like a dream. Our house shall live and stand more imperishable than marble, more solid than granite. Self-existent is God, for it is God himself. We abide in him. God is the house of our souls. How do you build this house? Through your faith and obedience in Jesus as your Savior. Amen. Spurgeon said this. He said, let us not build our house upon the moving quicksands of a deceitful world, but base our hopes on this rock that amid descending rains and roaring floods shall stand immovably secure. You got to build your house on the rock. Amen. Let's look at Matthew Chapter 7, before we close here. Verse 24 through 27. You want to build a house. 
Listen to how Jesus tells you right here. He said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was, uh, it was founded upon the rock. And then in verse 26 says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Whatever you're building in life, you want to make sure it's going to stand. That's why the Bible says store up things in heaven where moth and rust can't, can't get to it. If you don't know Jesus today, he welcomes you. He says, come. And all you got to do is come. That's all you got to do. You can do it right there in your seat. You can ask Jesus to save you anywhere. I always remember Peter when he's walking on the waves, when he starts to sink, you know what he hollered out? Jesus, save me. And Jesus, and it said Jesus immediately picked him up out of that water. Jesus would do the same for you right now if you don't know him. All you got to do is call out. Amen? I enjoyed it. Thank y'all for listening. But I pray for you every day. Build your house right. Build it on the rock. Because there's winds and there's storms out there and rain and they're blowing hard right now. And if your house is not built on the right foundation, it's going to fall. And the Bible says the fall is going to be terrible. Man, I'm glad I have Jesus Christ that I can rely on. Whew. Two years ago, I accepted him as my Savior. And I still, every day, I'm getting to know him better and better. I'm learning more and more about how much he loves me. Used to, I didn't have that assurance, man. I remember standing in that pew, and I had my hand on the back of that chair, and I was not going to go down there. I thought, man, i got to be saved. I work in Sunday school. I work in VBS. I tithe. I pray. I don't need to go down front. But I came to that point where I knew I needed to be saved. Because I remember the preacher saying, do you know without a doubt, without a doubt, without a doubt, that you're saved? And I couldn't say, yeah, because I had those doubts. But you know what? I have blessed assurance now. I have an assurance in my heart. When I do foul up, when I do sin and, 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 and stumble and fall, Jesus picks me up and says, hey, you're still mine. You've lost nothing. We all go through hardship, but Jesus is going to get you through it. Amen? Amen? Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to serve you, and I thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to, to learn about the house of our soul, God. And I thank you so much that you call us. You tell us to come. Father, we're so thankful that you prepared a house for us already. And you're going to come back and get us. Father, anybody, anybody in here that doesn't know you, let them come to know you today. Give them that blessed assurance. Help them know without a doubt that their house is built on a solid rock foundation. And no matter how bad the storms in life get, it's going to last. Jesus is going to pull them through. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think we'll play a verse or two. Mm -hmm.